So there are two components of online communication that have been very tightly coupled since the earliest days of the internet. And as we move on and as we grow and advance our lives online, they're getting more tightly and tightly connected. And it's time that we start talking about splitting the two of them up and treating them as separable concerns. If we don't, there's a lot of risk of having a very chilling effect on free speech, communication, and collaboration online. These two concepts are authentication and identity. Now, identity in general is one of these very hard to nail down philosophical concepts, but you can think of it as being a set of attributes about you that make you distinct from somebody else. They could be physical attributes like what you look like, or they could be social or contextual or behavioral issues. If I tell you that I'm really into photography these days, or that my favorite book of all time is uh, a James Joyce book called, um, well, I don't remember what it's called, and I don't remember reading most of it. If I tell you that I have a really cute dog, these are all things that you can use to build up a model of who I am, and you can connect me to conversations that we've had. You can build conversations about shared likes or shared background. And one of the really fascinating things about identity is that there's different facets of ourselves and different parts of our identity that we share with different people. If I'm spending time with coworkers, then maybe my identity is built up on my technical expertise or discussions we've had or where we go for Chinese food. If I'm spending time with extended family, then maybe my identity is built up on family photos or vacations that we've taken or phone calls that we've had over the years. And in either of these cases, there might be a lot of overlap between my behavior and between these attributes, but there's still distinct sets. And this is tremendously important for social interaction because it's one of the mechanisms that we use to have different conversations with different groups. Saying one thing to one group of people doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be shared by everyone in the room or everyone in your life. Now, identity online has been changing a lot over the last few years. Traditionally, it's been this very lightweight notion. You start with maybe a username or a handle or a pseudonym. And then everything else that people know about you online is built up on how you interact in a particular community, what you say, and how you act around people. And this has given us a wonderful meritocracy of ideas where you can take people from different walks of life and from different social contexts and bring them together to have a coherent conversation. And we were able very easily to separate parts of our lives online and engage fully in the individual conversations. In the mid-2000s, with the rise of social networking, we start seeing a shift in identity. We start moving towards heavier weight, more full, more complex identities that are rooted in our real-world personas, these social identities. And in order to build a real social identity, you volunteer a lot of information about yourself. You give up a lot of details that we used to hold as private. And a lot of people are willing to make that trade-off. You tell the internet where you work or where you went to school, and in exchange, you can find out that your college roommate just moved to Europe and had six kids. And this is a trade-off that I'm willing to make, and I think a lot of people are willing to make. Where it gets difficult to think about that trade-off and to reason about the long-term implications of that trade-off are when we start tightly binding that social identity to recent advances that we've made in authentication. Now, authentication in general is some mechanism where you can prove or assert who you are to another party. And this other party might be a government agency, it might be a person, it might be a website. So in real life, I might hand you my driver's license and you look at the photo and you look at me and you decide that we look enough alike that I must be the person on the card. Online, if you type in a password, in theory, you should be the only one with this password. So by virtue of you presenting the same password, you must be who you say you are. And as time has gone on and we've been putting more and more of our lives online, we've learned a lot. We've learned that these stakes for people impersonating us online have gotten higher and higher. We've learned that humans are notoriously bad at creating and remembering strong passwords. And we've learned that the organizations with whom we trust our passwords can be very bad at keeping them. You hear about very high profile breaches where user databases on the scale of millions of people get leaked and shared online. So the industry has been reacting to this in a lot of different ways, and the really interesting one for this talk is that the same organizations who are building these very rich and detailed social profiles for who you are have been pushing a technology called single sign-on. Now, how single sign-on works in general is you have an identity provider or an authentication provider. And this might be your email provider, it might be a social network, but it's somebody who's really done off right. In a lot of cases, they have entire teams that do nothing but obsess about authentication night and day. And then you have a constellation of other services. It might be a photo sharing website or a collaboration site or a forum about mid-range camera zooms. And they want really good, robust authentication, but they don't want to build it themselves. So they delegate it to this other authentication provider. 
So what you get is a big button on the website. We've all seen them. They say, log in with, and then some other identity. And at the 30,000 foot view, what happens is when you click on that button, a message goes to the identity provider and says, hey, Alex is trying to log in. Can we trust that this is Alex? And the large identity provider says, yep, that's definitely him. Go ahead and let him in. And for everybody involved, this seems like a really great solution. The smaller website doesn't have to build this massive, complex, robust authentication themselves. And as a user, I might have a very comprehensive or complex or onerous authentication process, but I do it once and then I use it everywhere. It's incredibly convenient. And these systems are becoming more and more popular. On a lot of websites now, you have an option when you go to create an account. You can either create a new identity using a username or an email address and a password, or you can reuse this existing heavyweight social identity. And in fact, in some cases, you don't have a choice. The only option is to reuse this existing heavyweight social identity. And that's where we start having a problem. Because when you use that identity to authenticate to every website that you go to, you're bringing that identity with you. You're tacking that name on every conversation that you have, and all of those different facets of our lives online are now being bolted together. And up until now, and presumably into the near future, it's been very easy for us to use mechanisms like pseudonyms or different email accounts to cordon off and section off parts of our online lives. But as these systems become more popular, it's getting harder and harder to keep this monolithic real world identity at arm's length. Now, pseudonyms are tremendously important, especially when we talk about free speech and especially when we talk about speech online, because pseudonyms are one of the mechanisms by which we can engage and have conversations without fear of reprisal, whether it's political or economic or social reprisal. In the worst case, there are actually countries in the world today that will persecute you for your online activity. If you live in Iran and you post a message that's critical of the government, on a web forum or on a social media website, you might actually have your door kicked in. Events like the Arab Spring would have been impossible without online pseudonymous communication because you can't build a bedrock of social pressure and of common interest if all of your organizers are being hauled off to jail. In less extreme cases where your speech might be protected from your government, it's certainly not protected from your peers. Ever since the Edward Snowden revelations, there's been this meme that if you are doing nothing wrong, then you have nothing to hide. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. There are a lot of conversations that we want to or need to have online that aren't suitable for broadcasting to the full closure of our social network. If you have an embarrassing uh, medical condition and you want to learn more about it or talk about somebody online, that's a hard thing to do if a simple search for your name will reveal every conversation that you've ever been in. If you're the spouse or the partner of a government employee and you want to talk about aspects of your personal life that might be embarrassing or might limit their career mobility, that's a very hard thing to do if all of your conversations are linked together. If you're an abuse victim trying to find a support group or trying to evade your online pursuers, that's a very hard thing to do if it's trivial to follow you from site to site using consistent identity. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some very good use cases for having an online identity rooted in your real world persona, because they are. But they tend to be very specific and maybe don't have as much overlap with the consumer web as we think. So Estonia, for example, has an incredibly successful national ID card system that has an online component. And citizens can use it to authenticate against government and banking and social service websites. And in a recent EU parliamentary election, nearly a third of the Estonian vote was able to be cast online because of this ID card system. And that is a tremendous step forward towards making democracy more accessible and bringing the vote to more people. But that has a very different set of identity requirements than a photo sharing site or a site where you comment on cat videos. Now, there's a lot of debate on this issue and a lot of proponents of the heavyweight social identity that follow you around everywhere claim that if you make anonymous communication too easy, then you open the floodgate for trolls and hate speech, and you just bring collective discourse on the internet down a few notches. And if we're talking about fully anonymous communication, I can see the merit in that argument, but we're talking about pseudonyms. We're talking about pseudonymous communication. And with pseudonymous communication, you can still have reputation. You can still build rapport. You can still have trust and have consistent conversations, but that identity might not be the same as the identity somebody uses all across the web, and it might not be under the same name by which their government recognizes them. There's a very large and incredibly popular commenting system called Discuss. Right now, they claim somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million comments a month and about a billion online unique views a month. 
And in 2012, they did a study. They looked at their data, and they stacked three groups of users for comment quality and comment quantity. The three groups were users who identified with their real name coming from a social network, users who identified pseudonymously, and users who were fully anonymous. And what they found was that the pseudonymous users had a much higher quality of comments than either of the other two groups. And in fact, the pseudonymous users posted 4.7 times as many comments as those identifying with their real name. And the conclusion that they drew from this was that it's the pseudonymous users who build up and bulk out a community. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. If you're able to communicate pseudonymously in an online community, you can engage fully. You don't have to worry about what people in other parts of your life are going to think. If instead, every conversation that you have is linked together, you have to be very, very careful about what you say and who you say it to. Now, there's been lots of interesting movement in both directions uh, within the industry. Google, for example, last year dropped the real name policy on Google+, so you can now use any name you choose for your social profile. And that's a nice step in the right direction, but having a different name on your still monolithic singular profile that follows you around the web isn't quite as good as having strong authentication but lightweight identities that you can choose at will. There's been lots of interesting research and development work towards different identity and authentication protocols. There's one called OpenID Connect, which a lot of these identity vendors are building their services on top of and could easily be tweaked to allow lightweight pseudonymous identities. There's another system called Squirrel, SQRL, and it has some really cool authentication properties, but what's neat about it from an identity perspective is it forces you to have unique identities for different sites. And if you choose to connect these things together, that's your choice, and it's an affirmative choice. It's very different from having to keep this profile at arm's length. If you are a performer or an artist, or if you have a particular skill that you want to be hired for, you might want to link your online life together, but that should be an opt-in process rather than having to go to extraordinary measures to keep this thing at, arm, at arm's length. Now, the industry is still undecided on authentication and identity. We don't really know where it's going to go and what the future looks like. And what's ultimately going to push the needle one way or another is going to be consumer choice and consumer demand. If every time we go to create an account on a website, we blindly do the convenient thing and click log in with some other identity, then that sends a very clear message to the industry that this is what we want. That what we want is a single, consistent, real-world identity that follows us around the internet and is attributed to everything that we do. If instead, the next time you go to create an account online and you still have a choice, if you instead choose that maybe this isn't the right thing for you, really stop and think about whether or not you want everything that you say and do to be connected forever. And if that's not the right choice for you, you should create a new identity. Thank you.